Hello and welcome to another episode of ISO 400. I am your host, Julius Motal. For those of you just tuning in for the first time, ISO 400 is a podcast by the Photographer where I serve as the managing editor. It is a video interview series in which I talk to photographers from all over the world about their art, craft, and story. This week, our guest is Mark Hemmings, a traveling commercial photographer from St. John, Canada, who is also the director of photography at Hemmings House, a media company he founded with his brother Greg in 2000. Mark teaches workshops, has been since 2004, and he does it all over the world. And when he's not shooting commercially, he's shooting street photography in any given city with only his iPhone. So in this episode, we'll hear about his story, his travel and commercial work, and what it's like to shoot on the street with just a phone. So sit back and enjoy. And as always, our music is provided by Yuki Futami, a New York-based jazz musician. And please subscribe to us below, and when we're on iTunes, subscribe to us there too. Thanks so much. Hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the third episode of ISO 400. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, we've talked uh, previously. We had interviewed you, I think, almost a year ago now. Um, uh, and what I learned about you, you had a pretty pivotal trip to Japan uh, many years ago with a bunch of slide film and some landscape shots in Nagano. Um, and then... Uh, I think maybe shortly after that it was you and your brother Greg formed Hemmings House, uh, which you've been with yes. uh, since then. Um, and was it 04 or 05 when you started teaching uh, photo workshops? Yeah, it was 2004, and that was in South Korea. Okay. And that was the first time I'd been to South Korea, and it was a, a real uh, fascinating experience. So uh, take me through that uh, first workshop. What um, Were there any challenges uh, in teaching that first workshop? How did you sort of develop your teaching style? Uh, what was it like for you? Well, the first workshop in South Korea, first of all, I never, as a Canadian, uh, I never encountered 40-degree heat. That, sorry, that's Celsius, but it was just so hot. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you take you take a shower, and then you step out of the shower, and you're sweating again because there's oh. so much humidity. But, uh, but um, yeah, I really found that I loved to teach photography and also filmmaking. And mm -hmm. uh, that I, was, I was invited by um, uh, the... Um, a, uni a university in South Korea that was a media university. Mm -hmm. And uh, before then, I had no interest, uh, no knowledge that I would like to convey uh, my my skills and my learning to other people. Mm -hmm. But I found I really enjoyed it. And uh, since that time in 2004 in South Korea, I've really expanded uh, teaching photography workshops uh, in different parts of the world. And mm -hmm. it, it really coincides nicely with my my commercial advertising magazine, whatever work that I do uh, in my normal day-to-day -day, yeah. uh, photography. And what do you? So, what do you teach your students? Are lessons customizable? Is it a set thing you teach in each city? How does that work out? Yeah, it's that's a good question because um, the different workshops have different curriculum. I, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, I'm in Mexico, in a in a town called San Miguel de Allende. Mm -hmm. And it's in the middle of Mexico, probably about four hours north of Mexico City. And because we are all staying in one central house or villa um, that we rent, we have time for, like, uh, we do um, excursions uh, to abandoned uh, haciendas and villas mm -hmm. and so on. But we also have specific classroom time where we teach on composition, we teach on street photography, teach on travel photography basics, portraiture. Mm -hmm. And so on. So there's there's a good mix of uh, learning. Um, you know, we we project uh, lessons up on a big screen, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, and some other workshops like the Japan workshop. Um, it's it's really you know there's so much activity. It's it's a lot of just you know on the street and not as much classroom time. Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond what you teach your students, what do you learn from them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the best things that I do as a, uh, as a photography workshop instructor, I, f I find, mm 
-hmm. is the end of workshop slideshow party. So what we do is we just uh, get a few bottles of wine and uh, we sit down at the big screen um, connected to my computer and each, each participant shows their 10 best photos of the entire week mm -hmm. and also uh, their what we call the fun photos that would mm -hmm. be the photos of, uh, that we take of, uh, of us as we're going around. Yeah. But it's the 10 best photos that really teaches all of us how perception is very different based on uh, the emotional um, the emotional state of the of the individual artist because we're all photographing the same thing mm -hmm. yet the photos are wildly different so mm -hmm. that is a, a, a fantastic exercise to really see you know we're all incredibly individualistic mm -hmm. um, and we have our own slant and our own style and our own take on mm -hmm. things that we're photographing together. Yeah. And how would you describe your personal take um, when you photograph and like how did that develop? Well, that's a good question. I, my, my, my commercial style that I use for my clients is based entirely on the, I would say, the, the Japanese um, advertising aesthetic, which is very clean lines, very, mm -hmm. very bright, very sharp. Um, mainly because that's where I learned how to become a commercial advertising photographer. But mm -hmm. I think that when I'm when I'm dealing with travel photography, I I love the sort of uh, Cartier Bresson style of black and white, mm -hmm. uh, 35 millimeter lens. You know, no options but one lens. You know, yeah. one <laughs> one camera. And um, I think that uh, that's the sort of uh, feeds my soul is to be out on the street mm -hmm. with a, a single camera, a single lens, and you have to just be in the in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you're pretty you're pretty avid mobile photographer too. I've noticed at least in the past year we've been connected on Facebook yes. and I've seen all your images. When um, when did you first start shooting with your phone? Um, and yeah. What was like the learning curve there? Yes, uh, it, was a, it was a good story and actually it originated here in Mexico I think mm -hmm. four years ago uh, when I was on this teaching this very workshop that I'm doing now. Um, I had my 5D Mark II mm -hmm. and it had, you know, the, uh, at the bottom has the battery yeah. uh, extender so it's a really huge camera and I also had I think a, probably 24 to 105 mm -hmm. and I tell you that's a heavy camera with two batteries in it. <laughs> So I was I was not feeling so well. I, I kind of was just getting over a cold that I got from cold Canada, mm -hmm. and I was walking the streets to see. You know, I I need a change. I'm not feeling. I'm not feeling this. This. I'm not enjoying street photography. I'm not enjoying myself. And I had one of those those existential moments that all photographers and all artists have. It's, am I really doing what I want to do? What What am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what, I have to change. So I pulled out, I had an iPhone 4S, mm -hmm. and I actually never took a single picture on it, uh, mm -hmm. except maybe a picture, picture of my, my kids. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to go back, put the 5D away, and I'm going to see what it's like to photograph here with the, the 4S. And my first picture... It was like the the epiphany. It was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I tell you, that was the the start. Uh, what I, I think the really start of my street photography passion. Mm -hmm. Before that, I you know I've I've been doing street photography in in Japan for years with DSLRs, but the the value of simplicity and limited options uh, mm -hmm. for a photographer I think is incredibly uh, rich, because when you limit yourself to mm -hmm. one lens. Um, you know, uh, one uh, very simple device. Yeah, you are really pushing yourself for creative, ex creative composition. Mm -hmm. And what kind of compositions did you see yourself sort of creating and taking on as you shot with your phone more? Well, uh, the answer is twofold. One is that I felt uh, that um, I could interact with with people much better with uh, the mobile phone because it wasn't intimidating. So prior to that, I had the huge uh, 5D Mark II with the huge lens and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And it was very, I couldn't have a rapport with people. I, mm -hmm. I felt um, that I was a paparazzi or I was stalking or something. Mm -hmm. But 
Uh, I think with the with the iPhone, and now I'm using a, a small Fujifilm uh, X100T. I think with these smaller smaller devices, mm-hmm. um, I'm able to smile and interact, even if I don't know the language in a certain country. Mm-hmm. And people are if if they see a smile on your face yeah. and you're you're not out to to steal their soul. I think you know that's you can really get some wonderful street photography interaction with people. Yeah, have you ever had any conflicts on the street? <clears throat> Incredibly, uh, I've had no conflicts, and uh, but I do have one. Uh, I was in China uh, last month, and I was uh, I was doing some street photography, and uh, a man just sort of did uh, did this, and you know what? I was really happy that that happened because mm. uh, I respected. Uh, he, he even he even had a sm- slight smile. He was not rude, of course. Yeah. Uh, he just didn't want to be photographed. I respected his decision, and even though it was a really great shot, yeah. I promptly de- deleted the photo and uh, out of respect because that is how that we um, we have this story uh, of culture of interaction with wonderful people Mm -hmm. and it's really entirely built on respect Mm -hmm. yeah no definitely uh do you find that you're when you're shooting on the street are you shooting with any ideas in mind or do you just each day is a blank slate what's your approach i think it's a yeah i think it's definitely tabula rasa blank slate and that's what i how i love to enter a situation and even though it's it, it may not be the wisest thing, um, especially in a, in a professional context when you have clients. Mm. It, it's, it's almost very rare that I will do research on, on the city and the history of the city prior to the trip. I find that I, I like to be thrown into a situation um, knowing almost nothing. Mm-hmm. And then after, after um, my trip, I will really get to study the history and the culture of the people. Now, I, that seems a little bit backward. But it works for me because I really want to um, to almost get lost mm-hmm. when I first enter that street. When I first enter that city, I want to purposefully lose myself, and uh, it's it's a wonderful feeling of of unknown and of mystery. Yeah. Um, oh, let me just check here. Um, what um, do you find that you're your street work informs your commercial work at all, or if the commercial work informs the street work, is there any give and take between the two? Or are they like two separate tracks in your mind? Yeah, good question. I, I think that the the street street photography work, which I I find is my art, um, my commercial work, which I also love, by the way, I, I get mm-hmm. so much fulfillment out of it. Of course, but I, I do see them uh, quite a bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very very sensitive. In a, in, a, in a healthy way to giving my client the, the, very, the very best uh, that they want and the very thing that they need. And, but when I'm, when I'm doing my own stuff uh, on street photography, I am, I'm, I'm hearing from my heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, while, while a lot of my clients in the commercial world, they give me uh, free reign to really create in a mm-hmm. style that I want, which I appreciate, Mm-hmm. But still, we have the parameters of will this image uh, support their their marketing drive or marketing en- endeavor, or will it fit within their their um, uh, their paradigm for uh, creating um, their advertisings or whatever? So it, it is a diff- two different worlds, um, mm-hmm. but uh, you know they both they both do come from my heart. Yeah, of course. Uh, do you think that there's possibly a book? In your future to come out of your street work, um, is there? Do you oh, f- I would love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that there are themes that kind of run through your images? I mean, when I've, from what I've seen, strong color and very sort of minimalist uh, composition. You don't. You tend to not make crowded images. Um, so where, like, what's the through line for your stuff? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that and. Uh, and also, it really shows that you have have seen uh, my work over time because I appreciate that you picked up on the fact that there's very few times I have crowds, and I love the lone 
subject, the lone mm -hmm. image, because I can really, I really like to draw out the personality of everyone who I photograph. Yeah. And uh, also I'm a minimalist and my compositions, the backgrounds are usually quite minimal and I usually have people placed um, within those uh, minimal backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that that comes from my formative years in Japan mm -hmm. where I really uh, learned how to create. And when you're in a place like Japan, minimalism is, is the, the dominant, dominant aesthetic. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really, they, they take powerful ideas and information and compress them into something so simple and something so, um, uh, it, something that conveys a powerful message in a very simple way. Yeah, of course. And if I remember correctly, you had started when you were in Japan shooting landscapes. Um, and what was, so what was the transition like to street photo and actually photographing people on the streets and not just scenes, whether it's buildings or mountains? Uh, what was that like for you? Yeah. And what did you learn from that? Well, uh, one thing that, that I do see is that the natural transition that a lot of my photography students will have is they, they, they start out as nature photographers or landscape photographers. Mm -hmm. And I really, and that's how I started out, by the way. I was, uh, because I grew up on the east coast of Canada. So mm -hmm. Freeman Patterson, uh, who was a master uh, landscape, master uh, um, photographer for nature and mm -hmm. for, uh, he, that was sort of, uh, I learned from his books. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in saying this, I want to be very clear that I don't see nature and landscape as any, any bit uh, less than mm -hmm. um, any other type of photography, but it just simply, in my, my case, I said, you know what, I want the soul of, of the person now. Mm -hmm. And I want to, uh, I want to I've, I've felt I've really, I've done well with nature, I've done well with, with scenics, but now I'm really searching for the soul of the human and yeah. the heart of the human. And um, walking around Tokyo uh, was really uh, a wake-up moment as well because uh, at near the end of my time living there, mm -hmm. I said, you know what, I love walking through the subways of Tokyo photographing people. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about Japan is that everyone's a photographer and there's no problem photographing people. Mm -hmm. And you can flip that around. You go to Niagara Falls and what do you have? You have uh, hundreds of Japanese tourists photographing like crazy, and they're photographing yeah. all of us. Yeah. Was there any um, trepidation on your part in the beginning? I've I've spoken to a number of street photographers, and at least in the first, I, I don't know, a couple of weeks, couple of months, there's always like that slight fear uh, that comes with photographing on the street. Did, was that was that a thing for you, or and if so, how did you work through it? Yes, yeah, because my I'm not an extrovert by nature. Mm. Um I'm sort of a, a introspective. I'm a, a thinker. I yeah. I graduated with uh you know, in philosophy. I was planning to become a a professor of philosophy. Mm -hmm. That changed by the way. Yeah, and I'm glad it did. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but um yeah, so because I'm not an in your face type of person, um it 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 has been uh in the early days um, how do I capture the heart and soul of a person without being an idiot, without being, you know, like a paparazzi, mm -hmm. without uh, being in your face? And I found that if I, if I craft my image in a, such a way that we have a, a nice expanse, a nice background that's very interesting, mm -hmm. and I just wait and watch people walk into my frame. Yeah. Um, that's that's my favorite way to photograph people because I feel like I, I can place them in their element, in their situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I can get a sense of their, their personality, but I don't have a lens in their face. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that works for me. It works for my personality. And um, I think that's how I, I charted my own course in, yeah. in my own history of street photography. And when you're in a place where you... Uh, where you speak the language, which I imagine is English. Do you ever interact with your subjects or do you just sort of let them pass through the frame and out? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good 50-50. What happens in, if, if a person is clearly um, en route from A to B, I don't want to bother them. It's, uh, you know, uh, 
if I, I get a nice image of them in their in their scene, uh, mm-hmm. they're just walking through. But I do actually, even if it's uh, even if I don't know the language, I will often. Um, you know, a, a smile and point to the camera, and uh, there are there are some scenes where I'm actually getting people who know that I th- I'm photographing them, mm-hmm. and then of course I'm getting scenes where where no one knows that I'm photographing them. So mm-hmm. it's it's a mixture, and it's entirely based on how I f- how am I, how am I reading mm-hmm. this situation? Do I feel that this is a situation where I would be disrespecting the person by secretly taking their shot, or is this a situation like uh, two young young lovers on Valentine's Day? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go up to them, ask them to take photos. They are in a public position, public uh, space, making out. You know, <laughs> they're in, yeah. they're asking for it. Yeah, no, they're they're asking for it, and I and I'll photograph them, and it turns out to be an amazing shot of of, of two two young lovers. So, mm-hmm. um, it, it's entirely based on the situation. And entirely based on how we feel in that instant, is this something that's that's okay, uh, or should I walk on? Yeah, with a lot of uh, photographers I've spoken to, um, they and me too, uh, we've all had that one image that we wish we had made that we either decided not to pull the, we not decided not to press the shutter, or we missed the moment, but we saw it. What's that image for you? Yeah, okay, very I had um there's been a couple, but the very first one that I remember very clearly and I, I apologize for keep going back to Japan, but no, it's, it's it was okay. a pivotal place. There was a place in Japan in the mountains that um that is the highest snowfall in the world ironically. In really? Japan, you know, you wouldn't think that, but what happens is that that the north uh, wind comes down from Siberia and mm-hmm. hits a mountain range in Japan. Mm-hmm. And all the snow from Russia gets piled up on this mountain range. Anyway, there was uh, a section of this mountain pass that I went through that it takes t- massive amount of trucks and uh, um, snow machines to cut a hole through about 30 feet of snow. And that yeah. kind of amount of snow is, is incredible. Yeah. So as I was driving through in this bus... I, uh, I looked at this, this wall. I was walking through like, like Moses walking through the Red Sea that mm-hmm. was parted. And I said, oh, I need to get out of this bus right now yeah. and photograph. I've never seen anything like this. I'm going through a tunnel of snow that's 30 feet high. And the bus kept on going. And I, that just gripped me because even though it didn't seem like uh, you know anyone else hearing the story said well wh- who who cares but as a young photographer mm-hmm. to have that opportunity pass by you like it was just this this uh, butterfly passing by yeah i almost cried because <laughs> uh, my soul was so frustrated yeah. that i could not get off that bus and a lot of uh, a lot of us would recognize that that is that that feeling Mm -hmm. of missing the shot is central to all artists actually and uh anyone who's 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 in touch with creativity Mm -hmm. and uh by the way we can all have that it's not just for artists but yeah that was my pivotal time and since then of course i've had many of those opportunities many of those experiences yeah and how did you how did you learn to deal with that how did you learn i mean it it still hits me and you know i feel it Mm. like how did you learn to kind of you, have you learned to let go i mean because we we're gonna go through that i think until the end so yes yeah exactly well sometimes i feel that like it's it's almost like there's a, a dagger that uh, gets put into your chest <laughs> that's the best way i can feel it you know mm. I, I feel this uh and um i just stop and say okay take a deep breath that was the coolest shot i've ever seen i missed it Take the take the dagger out of my chest. Yeah. Throw it to the ground and move on. Yeah. No, I I hear you. I still gotta learn how to figure that out. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's. You had mentioned before that you had gotten a degree in philosophy, and clearly you're not working in the philosophical field. Um, what? So what was the switch for you um, from what you studied and what you thought you might do uh, to what you're doing now? Yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was a good. Uh, I'm very ha- happy that you know I the life of academia was very enticing for me because I, I was top of my class. I was mm-hmm. I was very good at it, and I'm a natural thinker, so uh, it was a, a very good fit. But right after university, um, I was hired. Uh, because I knew the staff, I, I knew you know uh, the professors, and I was hired to uh, work on the university's ESL program, which is English as a second language. And um, one of the one of the, the the parts of that job was uh, our team, about eight nine people. We'd go around the world, especially to Asia, mm-hmm. to recruit um, students to come to the university, mm-hmm. and that was the. My exposure to Asia and to bringing my my camera with me was right. the you know I think that I would like to be a photographer mm-hmm. instead. And the wonderful thing is that a friend of mine um, called me up and said, "Mark, I heard that you know how to take a picture." <laughs> <laughs> so I had this. Uh, this was before digital, of course, and yeah. this was I had a Nik- Nikon. EM2, which was a uh, sort of a semi-manual camera by Nikon long ago, and I said, "Well, you know what? I I uh, I just learned how to take pictures in well on this trip in Asia," mm-hmm. and he said, "Well, I'm working on a Hollywood feature film, and and my boss needs a, a stills photographer to do location scout work." So I said, "Sign me up." So I, I didn't know very much, but I that was my the start of my career as making money mm. with my camera, and I worked on a number of uh, feature films, and I worked as the location scout photographer and also the on set stills photographer, mm-hmm. and uh, that was the beginning of my career. So I, I trace it back to the transition from the academic world, uh, my experience in Asia, and working in the movie industry. Right, and you didn't have. Um, as far as I under- know, uh, formal photographic training. It was all learned uh, just just by doing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's entirely the case. Uh, I've, never, I've never taken a lesson in my life, but I, I do take lessons, or I especially did back then, by reading magazines. So mm. my, uh, I, would buy, I would buy every photographic magazine that I could afford. Yeah. And it was so funny because I, I, my brother Greg, he's such a great guy. I, uh, I, I once had no more money, yeah. and I said, "Greg, can I borrow six dollars to buy a, a, a popular photography?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was really reluctant to buy. It. And he said, "Mark, I'm not, on, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to lend you money. I'm going to give you the six dollars." <laughs> <laughs> so That's he gave good. me the six bucks. I and, and that was my, that was my training is. Um, uh, in Canada, we have uh, a magazine called Photo Life, and that was a great, a great learning tool. Mm-hmm. And you know, l- I learned a lot from from books. Like I mentioned, Freeman Patterson's mm-hmm. books was uh, in the early days really uh, instilled a lot into me. And that's that's how I, I learned. Mm-hmm. Are there other particular favorite photo books uh, that you have either read or own? That's a that's a great question, and uh, you know, I try to look back. And many people ask me, "What are my influences?" Mm. And the influences are varied. And I, I did mention, of course, Cartier Bresson because he's sort of like a a figurehead for street photography. Yeah. And when I look at his when I look at his work, I I, I can really feel how he loved his Leica. Mm. It's a very simple device, but a really solid. Yeah. device to photograph and and when I, I I try to pinpoint my own influences and and I I must say that um, I think I think when I'm looking through books or magazines or if I'm in uh, you know Indigo uh, looking at the magazine section or whatever mm-hmm. there's two th- two things it's the street photographers um, that we all know and love and mm-hmm. also Japanese style painting. Hmm. And, and when, when we look at um, Asian, especially Japanese painting and artwork, it's incredibly minimal, like we were talking about. Yeah. And there will be a motif like a cherry blossom and nothing else. Right. Incredibly uh, effective and powerful. And I think that minimalism really went deep into my soul. And that's how I feel that, um, I feel that carries over into my work now. 
Mm, definitely. And you had mentioned in the uh, in the email interview we did um, earlier last year that there was the image by Gertrude um, Kasabi or silhouette of a woman uh, that really kind of sparked something in you. And what was it about that image uh, that did so much for you? Yeah, yeah, th- that still is a haunting picture, and uh, I don't know if it's possible for our our viewers to have a link to see it or whatever. I'll put it but, in the uh, post on the website. Yeah, I think I think at that time when I saw that image, I was going from that transition, like we talked about, where I was only photographing nature, mm-hmm. only photographing landscapes, but I felt that I needed to. Um, explore the human psyche, sure. the human soul, the, the position. And when I saw her image that was taken, I think in the late 1800s, mm-hmm. it was a very haunting shot of this woman praying, taken on, um, it may have been a pinhole camera or a cyanotype, I'm, I don't even remember, but mm. it was such a striking image that I said, I want to create images like she created images mm. where she took she could actually see into the person's soul through the eyes or whatever yeah. and uh, that was the, that that thing that shook my shook me on the inside yeah. and i said you know what i that's what i want yeah do you remember the context in which you saw it was it in a magazine was it in a gallery or like where were you when you first saw this image yeah it was. It's a very, uh, very interesting story because I was working um, to make money to buy film. <laughs> of course, I was working at Sa- Sam the Record Man, mm-hmm. and uh, it was Sam the Record Man in the United States or just Canada? There's. Uh, we have Sam Ash. I don't know if they're related. Um, okay. Well, Sam the Record Man in Canada was the record store that was nationwide. It was huge. Anyway, I worked at Sam the Record Man to make money to buy film and magazines. And uh, I was flipping through the cassette tapes. Um, I don't even know if that was when CDs were around. But anyway, I was flipping through the cassette tapes, and um, I came across the the composer, the Polish composer, Heinrich... Um, uh, Oh, I forget his name. It'll come to me. Yeah. But he was a Polish composer, and on the cover, uh, Gorecki, sorry, Heinrich Gorecki. And on, on his uh, cover, he had the, the photo of uh, the maiden at prayer. Mm-hmm. And it was simply by looking at this, uh, this cassette tape by this, uh, this composer. I bought, the, I bought it immediately just mm-hmm. because of the photograph. Yeah. And it turned out to be a, a very interesting composition it was called the Symphony of Sorrowful Songs mm. by Heinrich Gorecci, and uh, very, very interesting music. That really, I think, the image and the music fit very well together. Yeah. Um, in the course of our discussion now, you have sort of a um, almost a religious way of talking about photography and the way it, it affects your soul and what you've learned. Um, is it that way for you? Is it almost a sort of a religious experience? Uh, making. I would images? say yes. I would say yes, yeah, because I am a spiritual person. Mm-hmm. I, I do recognize that uh, the the art that I create mm-hmm. um, does does come from within me, mm-hmm. and I, I also find that that really helps me with regards to interacting with people. So, for example, um, our company we give uh, approximately ten percent of our our, our uh, Profits, as it were, to uh, helping the the world in whatever manner we can, either yeah. by giving time or teaching. Uh, mm-hmm. But part of that would be some. Uh, I've gone to uh, Eastern Europe mm-hmm. to teach photography to um, those who uh, could use a, a, an economic advantage to uh, to yeah. make money for young young kids, and and that sort of. Um, that sort of giving giving back to the world is that has been ingrained in me from my parents and from you know the the uh, the sort of the spiritual path that I have been on all my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the thing I ask every photographer in all these interviews: um, what is one piece of advice uh, you could give to a beginning uh, street photographer and also a beginning commercial photographer? 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I'll start with commercial f- photography first. Is that I I often um, get contacted emails or or whatever by uh, young photographers wanting wanting to, wanting to make it, mm-hmm. and their images are excellent. Um, they're very artistic, <clears throat> but even though it sounds very boring, sure, I really want to stress that you really need to take a, a basic business administration course, mm. even if it's just at the community college. Just go in the evenings, learn, learn what a spreadsheet is, learn how to do a budget, mm-hmm. learn how to do some basic marketing. Because we have, we have the, the artistic side and, also, and the, sort of, um, the business side. They have to merge. Yeah. And I really feel... I feel sad and sorrowful that we have so much talent in these young young photographers, but they they either don't know a thing about business or they don't want to. Mm. That has to change. You you have to learn the basics of business, uh, or it's not going to work. Or you, uh, you know it'll work as, yeah. but you won't work as you won't be able to provide for your family. Mm. Second, uh, as a street photographer, I I love to. I love to meet people around the world. I love to experience culture. I love to smile at mm. people. And I, I think that if you, if you, as a street photographer, if you see yourself as someone who is not only taking, like when, we, when we're, we're a street photographer, we're taking images uh, and creating art with them. And that's, I believe that's okay. Mm. But as long as we also are giving at the same time in an equal measure. Mm-hmm. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by saying, you know, like this morning when I, I woke up, I walked through town, I, I, I said buenos dias to, uh, you know, 10 or 15, you know, wonderful Mexican people that I walked past on, mm-hmm. on, the, uh, on the street. You know, that kind of, if we want to change the world, you know, we, we change it one person at a time. And mm-hmm. just by having a smile and saying good morning uh, to the people you see on the street, that really sets the course for the rest of their day. Yeah, no, of course. Well, thanks. Thanks so much uh, for doing this. This has been great. Um, Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, no, thanks for taking the time. Thanks so much for watching. This has been ISO 400. If you like what we're doing, please hit subscribe down below and share this with your friends. And let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks so much. See you next week.